everybody. It's time to start. My name is Oliver Schmidt. I'm directing the Center for Global Studies here at the University of Victoria. would like to welcome you to this webinar in our series on global politics and critical perspectives, transatlantic dialogues. And before we start off today looking at issues of security and diplomacy in a digital age, let me acknowledge two things. Uh, the first one is that although this is very much um, a, a webinar that takes place in the digital world, I would like to acknowledge that we meet here at the University of Victoria um, on the unceded territory of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples, whose traditional territory is here on site of the University of Victoria and the Lekwungen, Songhees, and Bosanish peoples, whose traditional relationship to this land continues to this day. Second, I would like to acknowledge that this webinar series has been co-sponsored both by the European Union's Erasmus Plus program and the Center for Global Studies, so I would like to express my gratitude for their support. With this, I would like to start us off into today's session um, looking at a ch fast-changing landscape and nature of security risks in our contemporary world. And what we're going to focus on today is a challenge that many of us thought with the end of the Cold War had been effectively and successfully tackled namely the threat of nuclear weapons and nuclear war. Um, if you think back to the age before 1989, um, the uh, amassment and proliferation and uh, buildup of the nuclear arsenal was very much part of the deterrent uh, policy that the two superpowers had at the time. The bipolar world um, shaped by the confrontation by the Soviet Union and the Western allies uh, was very much built on a huge capacity, a destructive capacity, and sometimes we look back and, you know, some of us might say that was also part of the absurdity of those Cold War years, that we had the capacity to kill um, ourselves many times over with this huge capacity, the nuclear arsenal that we had. Now, looking back over the past um, 30 years or so, yeah, there were very effective steps towards limiting um, the the amount of nuclear weapons, and also trying to, um, to, to restrict the proliferation of those nuclear weapons to other powers. As we know today, you know, we have only been partly successful in this respect. You know, we do have the, uh, the, the very uh, risky Iran nuclear deal in the media. We hear a lot about North Korea. We see how attractive it is for certain regimes to get their hands onto those weapons. We have the ongoing crisis in Asia with Pakistan and India, two nuclear powers page, facing each other. So um, we, we, we continue to live under this threat. And today I'm very pleased to have two distinguished colleagues from Vancouver joining us, um, Alan Sens from the University of British Columbia and Jeremy Cornu from Simon Fraser, uh, to discuss you know, what are um, what is the scope and nature of the challenge associated in particular with, you know, the threat of nuclear war? And what means do we as an international community have in diplomatic uh, ways, politically, looking at multilateral agreements, you know, to tackle this very threat? Before I come to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, let me briefly explain to you how this will evolve. First, we're going to have uh, two relatively short presentations, about 15 minutes, by our two speakers, after which you will see a chat box um, appear in which you can type your questions and comments. So you won't be able to, um, as listeners, won't be able to participate by speaking by audio, but you know, to type. And here you see, um, oh no, sorry, the chat box hasn't been moved yet. Um, we, we're going to have this. You might have seen it when you moved, came into the chat room. Um, so we will have hopefully plenty of time to engage in a Q&A session. With this, let me uh, move to our, our first speaker, Dr. Alan Sent is a professor in the Department of Political Science at UBC, and he specializes in international relations and international security with a particular interest in armed conflict and conflict management, so very much what we are going to talk about today uh, at Peace Corporation, Nuclear Weapons and Armed Control in the European and North American Canadian context. Recently, he uh, is a principal investigator, has been a principal investigator of the Shirt Partnership Development Grant on Knowledge Mobilization for radio broadcasting. I think we're going to speak in particular with respect to Jeremy a bit about um, 
issues of narrations, you know, um, public diplomacy, and and also the public debate about these issues. And um, Alan has also been the recipient of the UBC Cullum Teaching Prize in 20, uh, 2003 and uh, from the CPSA Prize you know, for, of Teaching Excellence in 2018. So with this, I would like to turn it over to Alan uh, for his uh, presentation. Alan, you, you can unmute your mic and start your presentation on the resurgence of nuclear weapons. Well, thanks very much, Jeremy. Uh, uh, and Oliver, uh, Oliver, can you, Jeremy, can you both hear me? Okay, terrific. Um, that means all of our guests can hear me too. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming uh, and logging in today. And I'm really looking forward to a, an exciting session. Uh, I really want to focus uh, on the big picture just to get us started. And, and I have a central theme today. And the central argument I, I would like to make is that we are witnessing the resurgence of nuclear weapons. Uh, nuclear weapons are back. And of course, they never really went away, but there was a period of dormancy during the 1990s, 2000s, when nuclear weapons weren't as much uh, front and center on the international security agenda uh, in ways that they are now. So I'd like to walk through a little bit some of the reasons why um, I'm making this claim about the resurgence of uh, nuclear weapons. And I think there's three central components. The first is increased tensions between Russia and the United States. The second is regional tensions, especially in places like the Middle East, in Northeast Asia and South Asia, which all have a nuclear weapons component to them. And then thirdly, what I see is the general erosion of the nuclear nonproliferation, arms control and disarmament regime and really about the whole diplomatic and negotiation practice in global politics that surrounds not only nuclear weapons, but many other aspects of international and global governance. And I very much look forward to hearing uh, what Jeremy has to say uh, on these pieces. So let me first just take a step back just to make sure we're all on the same page uh, with respect to the fundamentals. Uh, there's about 15,000 nuclear uh, weapons in the world today. And this chart uh, simply provides, I would say, the, the sort of global best guess uh, about the distribution of those weapons. There are nine nuclear weapon states. And of course, the vast majority of the 15,000 weapons in the world are in the arsenals of the United States and Russia. And you can see by looking at the chart here, uh, the United Kingdom with 215, France with 300, and um, China with 280 and of course those five countries add the US and, and Russia and you have the permanent five members of the United Nations Security Council and then you add to that um, other countries where we are less certain about these numbers so Israel we think about 80 um, Pakistan we think 145 India, perhaps 135, and then North Korea, 15 seems to be sort of the best global guess. But in that respect, that really is a guess. So I think when we look at this larger picture, though, uh, we do have a little bit of cause for some hope in that the number of nuclear weapons in the world, though fantastically high still, 15,000, is quite the decline from the historic peak in the mid 1980s when there were 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world. And this chart simply tracks that, you know, the number of warheads on your left and year on the bottom. And you can see that much of the global decline in the number of warheads comes from the decline in the US and Russian stockpiles. And that's the result of nuclear arms control agreements that were signed especially just before and after the end of the Cold War, which is why the resurgence of tensions is so worrying from a international um, treaty perspective. Let me now go on and say a few words about each of these three main reasons I make the argument for the, the resurgence of nuclear weapons on the global security agenda. Uh, I think that first we're witnessing um, increased tensions between Canada, uh, sorry, excuse me, United States and Russia, 
uh, well, Canada and Russia too, uh, but the United States and Russia in particular for our subject. Um, we're seeing some Cold War revivalism. Um, I, I think the situations are different, but we are seeing some similar patterns, Cold War behavior, distrust, um, aircraft incursions, incidents at sea, uh, a lifting of rhetoric uh, once again between the two countries, and that's always uh, a worry. I think of greater concern is the re-emphasis on nuclear weapons in the national security strategies of both Russia and the United States. And that's a, a particular concern. Uh, we're also witnessing a, a more assertive Russia um, with respect to the Ukraine, uh, Syria, the whole near abroad area, pressure being exerted on countries like Georgia, the Baltic states. Um, we're seeing uh, Russian cyber activity, of course, um, often uh, attributed, I think, quite accurately to attempts to destabilize and create divisiveness uh, within um, countries around the world. And so we're seeing a, a Russia much more willing to take more aggressive steps. We're also seeing, of course, uh, the Trump administration's approach, both to global governance uh, and to multilateralism in general, reflected in the area of nuclear weapons. Um, it, it's hard to see as great a contrast in nuclear weapons between two U.S. administrations as we've witnessed between the Obama administration on the one hand and the Trump administration on the other. Recall 2009, Prague, President Obama makes a, a dramatic statement about moving towards a non-nuclear world, being supportive of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, um, his own uh, nuclear posture review would go on to reduce the scope of when the United States might use its nuclear weapons. Um, in fairness, the, the administration never adopted the no first use policy and committed to the ongoing sustainment of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Uh, but nevertheless, there was much more of a momentum uh, and certainly much more of a commitment um, to moving in the direction of, of um, nuclear arms control. When Trump comes in, that, that turns literally 180 degrees about. Um, he's made statements to the effect that the United States needed to uh, expand, enhance, strengthen, modernize its nuclear arsenal. He's expressed on numerous occasions uh, impatience with nuclear arms control agreements. For example, calling the New START agreement between Russia and the United States, uh, quote, a bad deal. So we've seen a lot of this kind of um, uh, rhetoric, but also action on behalf of the Trump administration, where in the recent nuclear posture review, um, the United States uh, re-emphasized uh, the significance and importance of its nuclear arsenal. I think the next piece uh, that I'd like to take a look at is the regional piece. And I'm going to be brief here because we can discuss this in, in a little bit more detail as we move through. But in a Middle Eastern context, the big piece, of course, is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, or if you prefer the Iran deal, that's just a lot easier to say. So let's say Iran deal. And of course, that was an arrangement that covered um, enrichment, um, fissile material production, um, introduced a variety of verification measures, all of which Iran agreed to in return for the lifting of sanctions um, against Iran. And the signatories uh, to that P5 plus one arrangement are all there. You can see it on the slide. And of course, what has happened is that the Trump administration came in to power with uh, hostility towards the, the JCPOA, uh, a, a clear distrust that the ar arrangement was going to work, and that ultimately led to U.S. withdrawal from the agreement in uh, May 8th of 2018, and that has put the JCPOA on life support, and I think it's an open question about whether the agreement can be sustained. So that's a, a worrying regional element. Uh, now, that would be bad enough, but then we have East Asia, and in particular, North Korea. And what we've seen, particularly over the last 10 years, is the expansion of North Korea's nuclear capability, particularly in two areas. The first uh, is nuclear testing. They've conducted six tests since 2006. The last one, um, probably the, the final exhibition, if any more evidence was needed, that they have a fully workable design. Uh, whether that's a fission design, boosted fission, or a fusion weapon, not a whole lot of certainty about that. 
But when combined with the second element, which is the increasing sophistication and capability of their long range missiles, um, you have a combination here that is very worrying. And of course, the diplomatic effort to engage North Korea has uh, gone in fits and starts. And the most recent effort was, of course, the Trump Kim summit, which on the face of it had some groundbreaking elements, to say nothing of actually the two leaders meeting, um, but it did agree on denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, among other things. The problem is that was never clearly defined, and there were no details on timelines, testing, uh, missile production, inventory, verification, none of the sorts of things we would want to see as perhaps the beginning of North Korea re-entering the global regime, the NPT regime, the IAEA regime, the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, or the CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty for that matter. And now uh, we seem to be heading back into a period once again of tensions and a lack of communication with North Korea, so that's concerning. Uh, if all that wasn't bad enough, uh, we still have the South Asia situation, India, Pakistan, two countries that have fought three major wars and a number of other smaller uh, confrontations thrown in. And the delivery systems for both of these nuclear armed states are becoming increasingly capable. Their missiles have increasingly longer ranges and they're moving their delivery capacity into new technologies, particularly cruise missiles which perhaps we could have more of a discussion about uh, later. So for all of these reasons, I, I see a lot of uh, worry, not only from a Russia-US perspective, but also a regional perspective about the resurgence of the significance of nuclear weapons in these areas of the world. The last point um, I want to make before I conclude is I think a very worrying piece, uh, which is what I see as the erosion of the nuclear arms control regime. And I think this is actually a, a very consistent worry uh, amongst individuals who have always regarded this regime as an important bulwark uh, against arms racing, the threat of nuclear war, and the ability to at least create momentum towards denuclearization. Uh, all of these treaties or arrangements that you see here are under threat of one kind or another. The cornerstone of the non-proliferation regime is the non-proliferation treaty, the NPT of 1968. We're actually coming up to uh, a, a renewal uh, conference uh, 2020, and it's, it's just not looking good. Uh, there's a deep division in the NPT between the nuclear weapon states and the non-nuclear weapon states, and those tensions have really spilled over uh, publicly uh, over the last five years or so, and I can't imagine they're going to get much better. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty continues to be unratified and therefore has not gone into force. So this treaty bans uh, all nuclear testing but we as yet do not have the significant, uh, sorry, the required number of signatories and ratifications for the treaty to become international law. Efforts at a fissile material cutoff treaty have been in place for a long time, but again, the momentum on this treaty, which intends to ban any new production of fissile material for nuclear weapons, uh, has stalled. There's simply been no progress. The most recent development uh, was in 2017, the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or the Nuclear Weapons Ban. Uh, this treaty received a lot of publicity and there's certainly normative hope here, I think, but the problem is that the nuclear weapon states weren't involved and none of them signed and none of them ratified uh, and it doesn't look like any of them are gonna do that anytime soon. So again, it's a very limited instrument. Uh, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty which banned uh, delivery systems with ranges between 500 and 5,500 kilometers um, has come under increasing strain with the um, Trump administration actually suspending the treaty earlier this year and Russia then following suit. And that's over the issue of whether or not Russia was in material breach of the treaty with the deployment of a specific ground-launched cruise missile, the SSC-8. And we can talk about 
more about that if you'd like later. Uh, as if all this wasn't bad enough, uh, the new START agreement, which is the, the last of a series of arms control uh, arrangements on a bilateral basis between the United States and Russia, is set to expire quite soon. And there's been no negotiation on a follow-on, and that's, that's very worrying. And lest we forget, um, going back a few years now, the United States uh, abrogated the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in order to deploy uh, ballistic missile defenses against a possible North Korean threat. So that treaty is also gone and has been gone for quite some time. Um, it's particularly worrying, I think, that if the uh, New START agreement and the INF Treaty uh, die, uh, there will be no bilateral arms control, nuclear arms control agreement between Russia and the United States uh, in, in service, in force. And I, I think that's very worrying when you're talking about the two leading nuclear weapon states in the world. So just to conclude, where does all this leave us? Um, I think a return to security uh, dilemma, dynamics, and the, the very real risk of, of an arms race. Uh, I think a re-emphasis on deterrence, force modernization, um, which will, I, I think, have the potential to increase tensions uh, internationally, globally, US, Russia, and regionally. I think there's the ever-present concern of destabilizing technology developments, particularly in the areas of uh, hypersonic cruise missile technology, um, boost glide weapon systems, which, which we can talk about later. But one of the dilemmas of arms control is you've got to keep up. You've got to keep up with technological developments. And in the absence of a robust functional arms control regime, it's even harder to do that. So I, I think my concluding point is we, we need renewed public education. I think there was a real gap uh, in the 1990s and 2000s when nuclear weapons kind of faded from the front burner, as it were, in the, uh, both the public discourse and in security studies more generally. We've got a generation now that kind of grew up with not as much nuclear weapons education as they, they might have otherwise had. So I think we're playing a catch-up game to try to educate our populations and get people more ad, um, active in um, nuclear weapons issues and advocacy and becoming more engaged. I, I think that is also an often forgotten obstacle. Um, people just don't know as much as they used to about this subject matter, and I think we've got to do better to try to encourage that level of public knowledge. So those are my uh, prepared comments, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, to listening to what Jeremy has to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, for this sobering account, you know, of where we're at with respect to the threat posed by nuclear weapons. And, you know, I think your last phrase here, catching up, um, is very appropriate, uh, thinking about the proliferation of these nuclear um, weapons, but also the technological developing, uh, development um, that underlies, you know, this this development here, it is is quite sobering to realize, you know, um, that the, the the threats posed by nuclear weapons um, are changing um, and they become more pertinent in, in many respects, considering new technologies for these um, rockets that could and um, the possibility to deliver those and the new actors on the block that that can use those, and I think. Uh, the public is not aware of many of those kind of risks, and I think it's it's very important to shed light on where we're at in this respect. And myself, having lived through the Cold War, you know, it feels like almost déjà vu, you know, now with different actors. But but still, you know, it is uh, sobering to realize that we haven't re effectively banned and controlled nuclear weapons to the degree that many people had hoped back at the end of the Cold War that we were you know, embarking on. So. Let me, with this, let me come to uh, to introduce Jeremy Cornu uh, from the Department of Political Science at Simon Fraser University, where he's an uh, assistant professor with, with a research interest in digital diplomacy, public diplomacy, international relations uh, theory, and Canadian foreign policy. And you can see here, Jeremy is widely published um, with respect to uh, different journals that look into international security issues. And um, he's currently uh, working on the transformative impact of technology and diplomacy. And I, I suppose that is also the background for his presentation. 
So Jeremy, thank you very much for joining us today and giving us your perspective um, on uh, the digital diplomacy, as you uh, call it, and its impact on international security. So I'm going to mute my mic now, and uh, Alan, you can do. I think you, or you have already uh, muted my, your. Thank you very much, Oliver. Thank you, Betty, for organizing the conference. I, it's new to me, and I think it worked very well so far. So I'm really impressed. I think uh, we should do that more often because it's. Uh, very convenient and, and open to the public. So congratulations for putting that together to both of you. Thanks, Alan, for your presentation as well. I think in a way our presentation are different because you look at hard security and I would look at maybe in more constructivist perspective on on the ideas and the narratives that are around. But in a way we speak to the same reality, which is the resurgence of tensions. And while I was listening to you, I was struck by the fact that the more I think about these issues, the more I think social media is both fueled and fueling tensions. And it's the same with nuclear weapons. In a way, they are the result of the resurgence of nuclear weapons are the result of increased tensions, but they are also the sources of these uh, tensions. So there are interesting parallels here, and uh, I think the two presentations, although they are different, are very much about the same thing, which is how can we explain that, well, things uh, look more tense now than five years ago or, or so on. And if um, Alan was talking about nuclear weapons, I'm talking about social media and the impact of social media. But you'll see there are some interesting parallels. In a nutshell, my presentation, and you see, we'll, we we see that uh, it, it was written in French, so it's outlined. In the, the not recognized word outlined in, in as not as wrong anyway. So, the, in a nutshell, I look at how diplomats use narrative, use social media to promote their strategic narrative. I'll explain what I talk, what I mean by strategic narratives. Uh, just to say a few words about my theoretical framework, I use. Uh, practice theory and uh, the lens of nar repertoire and narrative practices. I'll say a few words about it. Um, I think it's a good contribution to our understanding of the impact of digitalization on first diplomacy at the front lines, so diplomacy uh, in the world, not from headquarters, but out there, and the international security. And uh, you'll see why. My case study is on Twitter and diplomatic engagement with Russia. Mm. I have two case studies. So if you think about Russia and social media, usually the impression is the one you see here, which is that, well, Russia uses Twitter, Facebook, and Google as a missile to threaten the West. And I think it's, it's true. I, there is no question about that. Uh, we recently see that with the Mueller report. Uh, there is clearly an attempt by Russia to destabilize the West and the U.S. in this case uh, to to promote a different narrative and, and so on. We'll see uh, how it works. My presentation, in a way, look at it from the other way around. Maybe we could draw a cartoon like that with uh, the White House launching missile from Twitter, Facebook, Google towards Russia. So the logic are similar in both cases. It's how we use social media to create narratives that create tensions. But rather than looking at it from, from how Russia is threatening us, I look at how Russia might feel threatened. And um, I think it tells interesting things about uh, international security. It tells things about how tensions are created by the discourses that are around here. So from now on, I've said everything I've, um, I will say. So if you don't, if you don't want to listen to me now, you've got the presentation uh, in a nutshell. If you are interested by the details, well, uh, that's uh, how I will present uh, my uh, work. First, I'll say a few words about third cap framework, and then I'll present my two case studies. So the humanization of the diplomat and the trolling, which are the new tools in the repertoire of, uh, of digital diplomats. What do we mean by strategic narratives? It's uh, famously defined uh, by Miskiman. 
uh, it's, uh, they are means for political actors to construct a shared meaning of the past, present and future of international politics to shape the behavior of domestic and international actors. So there are two things that are very important in these definitions. Narratives, strategic narratives, give sense to events, intention and actions. The missile from Israel is not the same missile as North Korea, if you look at it from the perspective of the US. Why is that? It's because they are, this missile, they are um, making sense within a narrative that are different. Israel as an ally and North Korea as a threat. So anything that happens in the world is only constructed as it is because it's part of narratives. The second thing that is important in this definition is that narratives are sources of mobilization. They make us do things. And it's clear in the Mueller report that Russia was able, because of the narratives it creates and fueling anti-elite uh, movement, it was able to make Americans go in the streets and create rally against Hillary Clinton. So, you know, they believe, people believe in things and they start doing things accordingly. A good example of that is the famous distinction between terrorists and freedom fighters. I say famous distinction because it's always like that in international politics. The terrorists of some are the freedom fighters of others. If you, uh, if you look at any terrorists, it's always because they believe in a cause and the other who believe in cause, in the same cause, are, uh, see them as freedom fighters. It's true in the case of Crimea, and here I, it's a way to introduce my case studies. Uh, look at the referendum in Crimea. There are two very different narratives about it. Uh, from Ukraine, it's a monster, and from the Russia perspective, it's a butterfly. Nothing new so far. Uh, I'm sure you are uh, aware of this different way to frame uh, the world. International politics in a nutshell is a battle of narratives. The question is whose story win? Who uh, makes, uh, who is able to write history? Usually uh, we tend to think that the victor is writing history. It's no longer the case. Now you need to write history to win. So this creates a bit of a different landscape. When you write history, when you do promote a narrative, you're always selective, you always take away some things and keep others, so you are selective. And if you are selective, it's because you are in competition with other narratives. And this is exactly what I'm interested in, in the competition between narratives. How are international actors nar promoting some narratives and, and uh, making, marginalizing, trying to marginalize others? So I look at narrative practices, and if you're interested by that concept, you can look at my article with Alicia Fezulayev and Cor um, uh, in the Journal of International Relations and Development. We develop the framework of narrative practices. We, we, we look at how do international actors spread and transform political narratives, and we uh, identify a way to understand and to analyze that. What is clear after this study is that political actors use narratives strategically, uh, of course, they manipulate narratives to their own advantage, certainly, uh, but in a way they are also constrained by narratives. You cannot invent a story completely crazy without connecting it to what uh, people already believe. So they, they, that's, that's where strategic imp uh, of the strategic dimension of narratives matter. It's because they are constructed and manipulative, but also uh, they are part of existing stories out there. So uh, political actors are also constrained by them. Another thing, some actors are better than others to promote their narrative. So they are more or less successful storytelling. You have different audiences, different languages, different ways to communicate. Some are good and some are not good. And we see Trump partially why he's so successful in terms of a politician, because he was able to promote a specific narrative through social media very efficiently in a way that probably Hillary Clinton wasn't able to, to counter. And finally, there is a new role for non-state actors in narrative practices, because as you, will see, as you will see, diplomats, they want retweets, so they need to engage with their audience.
Let me say two very quick things about narratives, because uh, I'm sure uh, it's important. I'm sure you already know it, but it's still interesting to, to know. The power of narrative depends on two things, the extent to which pe people believe in them, and this, in turn, depends on the collision with existing narratives. So you cannot invent crazy stories, as I said, because if it's crazy, well, people won't believe in it, and, you know, it, it, it won't work. You won't promote your narratives. The power of narratives does not depend on how truthful they are. Whether they represent reality or not is not that relevant in the end, because what matters is, is people believe in them. So that's all the plot theorists' uh, approach to international politics, where they invent stories that are completely um, disconnected from the truth, but still uh, they are very, in terms of politics, very efficient and they need to be taken into account because people believe in them. So it's not saying that, well, plot theories are not true or wrong or untrue. We need to say that and we need to repeat it, of course, but uh, it's always interpreted as part of the narrative itself. So this makes things more complex and uh, this asks that the important task of um, criticizing plot theories, for instance, require imagination and creativity, because from the perspectives of people who believe crazy things, they, uh, you are the one who is uh, gullible and crazy. Last point on my theoretical framework, I look, this is the general picture, I look specifically at frontline diplomacy, so diplomats on the field doing the prom making, promoting their narratives, and uh, especially how they use social media to promote these narratives. There are new forms of storytelling, and I'm interested by these new forms. How can diplomats use social media to promote more efficiently their strategic narratives? For them, the goal is like anyone who wants to have an audience, is to broaden their audience, so they want to have as much followers as possible, and for that they need to engage with civil society, with NGOs, with journalists, with academics, foreign citizens, anyway, any, anybody in other ways, because they need retreats. So for the first time maybe in history, public diplomacy begins to be a two-way street, where diplomats need to listen before they speak. Why is that? It's because if you want to promote a narrative out there with the Russians, for instance, as we will just see now, well, you need to understand them, you need to know them to speak their language. So you also need to listen. Obviously, it's not a, a level discussion, right? But still, diplomats need much more than before to know the audience they are engaging with. Okay, two case studies the, in the repertoire of public diplomacy. The first one is uh, the uh, humanization of the diplomat, and, uh, and I take the example of U.S. ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall, between 2012 and 2014, and then the other one is trolling, and I talk about the Twitter war between Russia and Canada in August 2014. It's a uh, two good example in a way because one is positive, you humanize diplomats to promote a political message. The other one is trolling, so you try to uh, harass uh, your opponents to get your message out there in the same context with the same purpose in a way, which is promoting the Western narratives uh, in the conflict between the West and the East. So mm, I've a lot of examples of the tweets that Michael McFaul uh, has been used. I've selected this one in particular because uh, you'll see um, how he's just using uh, his appreciation of Will Smith to promote his political message. Will Smith is especially famous in Russia because Man in Black is a uh, great uh, blockbuster there. So by showing friendship with a star that is loved uh, to Russians, Michael McFaul is able to show that, well, the Americans, the US government is not the enemy of the Russians. It's trying to promote a message of peace and to uh, go against the media that are state-run in Russia and that emphasize how um, the U.S. are threatening Russians. So, 
Michael McPulse was the, was very efficient in using social media. He started in 2012. He uh, he re rapidly became very good at it. He got a very big audience in part because he was able to speak Russian and to promote a narrative in Russian to Russian people. So a lot of followers for him. It was a good way for him to circumvent censorship and state control media because the traditional media. He would do a press conference, but it would be much longer first, and then it wouldn't be, um, uh, it would be filtrated by, by uh, government uh, influence. On the contrary, on social media, he was able to promote his message very, uh, very directly to engage uh, in Russians, with Russian directly. Let me just show you another example. Here are all the pictures he had shared uh, on, uh, on, on his Twitter feed. Uh, I mean, you would see Obama, you would see him dancing, uh, the rock and roll, and you would see where he engaged with his wife in a, in a very nice place in Russia. But let me just say a few words about the, the first picture here, where we see him as a young um, adult in college and a black friend in, in playing basketball or something like that, watching a game in basketball because he likes basketballs. Well, he obviously, this picture has been retweeted extensively and it's, a, it's promoting also a message of tolerance, of it's fighting racism in Russian society where, uh, well, uh, racism and xenophobia is on the rise. So by, by, that's why I talk about humanizing, humanizing the message of the diplomat. He is able to have a political message and to promote this political message through, well, personal anecdote. So by tweeting this picture, this picture being retweeted extensively, obviously this makes, um, a promotion, this promotes values and interests of the U.S. in Russia and in the, end, the, the U.S. narratives about how, at the time of the reset, well, the U.S. and Russia could be friends. My last example, is, my second tool in the repertoire of public diplomacy is the trolling, in the case of trolling. So I'm sure you all know this uh, Russia, not Russia map because it has been very successful and it has been very successful because it's a perfect example of trolling. I've, uh, I, I mean, Alan Sands, probably you know him, uh, he's a, a PhD student at UBC. The guy who designed this map is, um, was doing it like in 10 minutes, very quickly between two meetings, and uh, he thought he wouldn't be retweeted by his uh, boss. But the Canadian um, in charge of the Twitter feed find it relevant at the time there is a context that uh, where the British um, diplomats were pushing their uh, allies to do more to counter Russia propaganda so he thought it would be good to retweet that map and obviously it went crazy and it's a very fascinating story I have no time for that now but very interesting story about how it became uh, it goes all over the place and there are thousands and thousands of tens of thousands of retweets. It's the most retweeted tweet by, uh, by Canadian diplomacy by far. Um, and well, the intern in charge of, of the Twitter feed wanted to continue the battle, but the boss of the, the, the chief of the delegation at the uh, NATO headquarters in Brussels said, okay, no, we'll stop here. Anyway, our message is clear. Uh, and in fact, if you look at this, um, this map, probably none of you have seen it. It's the answer by Russians on that um, on, on that uh, front, where they say, okay, helping our Canadian colleagues to catch up with contemporary geography of Europe, and they they, they draw a design where Crimea is part of Russia. None of us have seen this map, probably, or very little of us. Why is that? It's because the trolling was successful and Russians were not successful in promoting their narratives on social media uh, this time. They have been, they have learned from their mistakes now and they are more efficient now. <laughs> okay, as a conclusion, I want to um, mention a few things. So we see how international relations is disrupted by communication technologies. Obviously, winning hearts and minds is not new. What is new is the context in which we, how we win arts and minds. It's a network society. There is a new kind of global sphere and uh, ideas circulate quickly transnationally in ways that it wasn't the case before. And this changed how international politics works. 
national and transnational public sphere become a battlefield uh, and social media have changed how we uh, navigate uh, narratives. All of us, in a way, are proponents of narratives much more than before in our retreat, in what we say, in our Facebook uh, profile. Um, in turn, this has changed the message. I can say more about it if you want. Uh, one striking example is that it has transformed how we think about international politics, probably simplifying messages. So the message has been changed by the medium, because on Twitter you cannot explain very well the minute details of international politics. Last slide, uh, it has transformed international security, first because power has changed form. In a way, the use of social media is a strategy for weak political actors that cannot compete in other realms. Um, there is, in that new landscape, a strategic role for non-state actors. Uh, there is also a strategic role for private and, and secret activities. And finally, it's much more difficult to build uh, shared narratives and to find compromise in, on Twitter uh, for reasons that we can discuss. Thank you very much, Oliver, again, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, fascinating to hear, you know, uh, coming more from comparative politics, you know, the, the role of narratives and communication in shaping policy issues, you know, has no long-standing uh, feature, but you can tell that in, for international politics, thinking through the implications for diplomacy, dealing with conflict, and shaping issues, I, I think, you know, you have a very good point here in, in showing how the medium itself has changed some of those ground rules. We've always tried to spin stories, you know, and also in the national politics, but I think there is a new dimension to this. And we currently have a U.S. president who seems to do foreign policy with tweets, you know, at times. And it has, you know, it has changed, you know, the way uh, things are being communicated, the impact they have. But also, and I think that was fascinating, it has opened up new channels of, um, of communication, of, of mutual understanding. You, your first example here the good, you know, indication of the potential also for this digital diplomacy. So um, for our listeners here, you know, we just moved in the, uh, the chat box uh, that you see here. Uh, please feel free to, um, to start typing here uh, comments and questions. Um, Alan, do you want to react to Jeremy's you know, presentation? You know, from, from your perspective, you've been along time scholar of international security, do you see this, uh, the potential and also risk, you know, for misunderstanding or misconstruction of issues uh, that comes from the digital form of communication and building these kind of narratives uh, in the internet? Yes, I mean, I, I really enjoyed the presentation, uh, Jeremy. In fact, I, I think there's a, a direct relationship um, between the work you're doing and, and your presentation and the themes um, that I was discussing. I think I'm sort of of two minds. On the one hand, I'm actually kind of even more terrified now than I was before I listened to your presentation, Jeremy, because I see the, the potential for um, oversimplification and for amplification of nuclear narratives in a way that are quite damaging to diplomacy uh, to popular understanding about nuclear weapons, uh, to the extent that uh, rather simplistic narratives surrounding national prestige, uh, power, and so on, um, become part of that ongoing narrative. I mean, it, it's, nuclear weapons have always been part of this, but what social media does is have the potential to amplify those sentiments. Um, we see how closely the link has been drawn, both in India and in Pakistan, for example, between the possession of nuclear weapons and national pride. To, to the extent that the, the early instrumentality of that, uh, governments promoting nuclear weapons as an element of national development, an element of national power, an element of national prestige, as well as defense and security have now been amplified to the point that they mutually reinforce one another in times of crisis. And I think that's very worrying. 
On the other hand, I'm struck, Jeremy, and here's where I, my other part of me is hopeful, that social media provides an opportunity to also amplify narratives that are intended to inform, that are intended to advocate for nuclear arms control and perhaps even disarmament or nuclear non-proliferation by giving another avenue to what used to be protest movements that relied heavily on film or editorials in newspapers or large public marches that would appear on television. Now we have this technique that promises to reach out into a broader constituency and serve the cause of public education around nuclear weapons. I, I think what I see developing though, and, and apropos your last comment, is that this is happening in, in different worlds of communication, in different cultures and in different uh, echo chambers, to use a, a, a more commonly used expression these days. So it's, it's people listening to things that they're already comfortable with. And through social media, either by a process of self-selection or, or algorithmic design, they are excluding or excluded from other perspectives. And so we have a hardening of positions. We have less of a terrain or a space for a common exchange of ideas and views. And that does worry me a little bit. I'm, I'm concerned that one of the implications of your, your uh, observations in your talk is actually uh, an increased barrier to the, the same kind of common space that we can have that conversation, whether you, you do believe in deterrence, you do believe in nuclear weapons as being an important national security uh, uh, piece, or you believe very strongly in arms control and disarmament. If those two people aren't having that conversation, I'm, I'm not sure that social media is actually going to be a, a force for the common good. Uh, but really enjoyed it, Jeremy, and I think there's a lot of parallels actually between what uh, what I was saying about nuclear weapons and what you're saying about, in effect, um, a, a new realm of discourse that we all have to pay much more attention to as we go forward. Thank you, Alan. And if you think, you know, um, linking these two presentations, if you think about the Iran nuclear deal, if we call it this way, um, what you also see is the um, how international politics and domestic politics gets, you know, combined and generates also a different kind of challenge, right? If you think about the communication about um, the legitimacy of developing certain weapons, you know, the, the deal with the, with the U.S., uh, threat to Israel. So you can see how also these international issues are, be, are used in a narrative, you know, that has more domestic political purposes. Those in the U.S. at the moment and, and in Iran or, or you know, Russia, you, you can go around the world. So it makes things even more complicated uh, than this. You know, so some people would argue when diplo diplomats could work in you know, the shadow of, uh, of secrecy, you know, that was more effective decision making. Now these debates are drawn into the open and they resonate with you know, domestic politics, you know, with, with highly divisive issues. So you, know, you can see uh, also why Alan highlighted, you know, the, uh, if you want, the, the ambivalent impact, you know, digital diplomacy will have on, on our capacity to address conflict and, and security threats. Um, let me um, go to, uh, to, the, uh, to the first question that I see here. Um, uh, uh, let me see. So treat, treat diplomacy, you know, that we, we started discussing this strength for peace and you know, the weak points that when it comes for peace were treat diplomacy, I think this is a new term, I guess, you know, that's the, the term. Uh, and the other one is um, coming from Frederic, uh, thank you for the presentation. A question for Alan, what is behind the collapse of the nuclear arms agreement and those uh, interest is development and who is driving the agenda? So we, you know, Alan, you offered in your presentation to address the the nuclear deal, you know, why, you know, where, where are we at, right? You know, so why has it collapsed and what is your assessment of the situation? If you think about nuclear threat at the moment, the nuclear deal with Iran is probably at the top of your, of your mind. You know, how do you see this evolve? You know, we just had European envoys going to, the, I think the German foreign minister was just in, in Tehran to, to discuss this, a real rift between the Western allies um, in Europe and the U.S. Could you give us a Certainly. I mean, I think the, the question is uh, really puts 
its finger on one of the central themes, which is a, a fundamental uh, disagreement or contrast now with what for quite some time was a, an albeit rather unstable set of understandings about how nuclear arms control could be complementary to national security strategies, that the two could work in tandem. And the idea here was that by using diplomatic and uh, international legal mechanisms, one could achieve in a multilateral or bilateral context uh, the same level of security, but at lower levels of political tension and especially lower levels of expenditure. So if you signed an arms control agreement with another country, you're spending less on nuclear weapons. And in many respects, then you had a, a sort of a self-interested national security strategy motive baked into the larger idea that multilateral or bilateral arms control could serve a larger purpose. Maybe it wouldn't take you down the road to disarmament. Maybe that was never the intention. But the idea that you could restrict, manage, control uh, nuclear weapons in ways that were positive for stability and a otherwise uh, reasonable uh, relationship between two or more countries was sort of the bedrock of the understanding. What we're seeing now is that understanding being undermined. Uh, flat out in cases uh, completely disagreed with. So now we're seeing in the United States in particular, the motive is actually to challenge Iran fundamentally, not just within the area of nuclear weapons, but more broadly. One of the big criticisms in the United States and elsewhere, to be fair, of the JCPOA was that it did not address wider Iranian policies in the Middle East, especially with respect to support for movements like Hezbollah or its actions in other parts of the Middle East or its uh, diplomatic approach to Israel. Now, the response from advocates of the JCPOA was, well, it was never intended to do that. This is an agreement about Iranian nuclear weapons. And if we're gonna get that agreement, and manage or control the Iranian nuclear program, we have to build a firewall between all these other issues or we're never gonna get anywhere. There's gonna be no progress. What we've now seen with the Trump administration is uh, going to a much larger sense of Iran as a threat, talking about Jeremy's strategic narratives. I mean, this is, this is a very strong one. And so we're seeing a, 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 a a comprehensive strategy of exerting maximum pressure on Iran on a number of fronts. And in that context, then, the JCPOA is seen as just yet another lever to be manipulated. And with the hostility towards arms control in general in the Trump administration, it was an easy piece to grab and withdraw. And that is the motive at least of the Trump administration with respect to pulling out of the JCPOA. One could say the same of, of the INF uh, and the global regime generally. Now, I, I wanna be very careful here. It's not just actions of the United States government that have been challenges. We have seen nuclear weapon states in various geometries politically come out with policies that are very obstructionist in arms control forums. Um, so I, I don't want to put everything on the U.S. That's not fair. But in the case of the JCPOA, I think that is clearly the motive of, of the Trump administration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think, Jeremy, you there are two questions for you, you know, uh, now that relate to uh, our uh, foreign minister's tweets regarding Saudi Arabia and the quest to uh, to release the human rights activists. So come, one comes from Jody Walsh, and Jody is with a bunch of people here next door. You know, they're watching this webinar here at the Center for Global Studies. Uh, she says, words matter in, in diplomacy. Can you address the risk of quickly written tweets, perhaps and carefully vetted, that could be counterproductive if the wording isn't precise or nuanced? You know, they, and then it's the, the Saudi arrests. You know, I, I think we're all, you know, uh, 
we all know about quickly written emails. So we, 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 we know how this could work. And in diplomacy, you can do a lot of harm by, by not uh, vetting these uh, properly. And also uh, from Eric Querci, um, also again, thanking you. And, and very similar question. Could you please comment on President Trump's Twitter diplomacy uh, and or on the Canadian Foreign Minister Christopher Freeland's tweet to release civil society activists in Saudi Arabia? That, you know, you all those quickly written statements, you know, they, they are part of forming the narrative, Jeremy, that you described, but they also can have, they can backfire, they, they can have unintended consequences. So do you see um, this to be a challenge in your... Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, I'll say a few words uh, about all of them. First, I just wanted to jump on, on what Oliver just said about, or said before, about, well, does public diplomacy makes diplomacy more difficult? Because you can have a settlement behind, behind closed door, but publicly it's more difficult. Um, I mean, I think it's, we cannot make a statement on principle on that, because for, for a long time. On the contrary, if you remember Woodrow Wilson, the idea was on the contrary, if the public is able to check on elites, then we'll have peace. While if uh, the elite are left to themselves, well, we, we won't. Uh, we will have war. If you look at even a peace agreement negotiated behind closed door, at some point it will be made public and you will need to find a way to frame it so that it fits the narratives that are out there. So you can have a very materialistic or realistic understanding between two diplomats, but in the end you will have to have people on board and to have them on board you will have to uh, promote a narrative that fits what they already believe. So I don't think we can oppose public diplomacy and, and secret diplomacy. The two are complementary, they, they work differently, they follow different rules, but you cannot do one without the other. And certainly you cannot say that one is more in favor of peace than the other or the way around. This leads me to the other question, does public diplomacy on Twitter lead to more conflict or less conflict? Here again, um, if I had to choose an answer, I would say so far it's it creates bubbles, echo chambers, uh, narratives in isolation, trolling. So it, it fueled conflict. It fueled extremism. It fueled radicalism. It fueled populism, which didn't lead to a better understanding of uh, people across borders. So, but if you look at Twitter, it's designed, of course, to communicate, but to communicate in simplified ways. It's a limited number of, of uh, of characters and uh, wide audience. In a way, in that context, you cannot hope for a lot because problem, political comp problems are complex and they won't be solved on Twitter. So Twitter is not the tool designed to resolve international um, conflict because international conflict, most of them are very complex and uh, I, I did a piece, I compared how UN, the debate on Crimea happened at the UNSC and at, how they happened at, the, at Twitter, and that's a completely different thing. I mean, at the UNSC, so the UN Security Council, they would look at international law very specifically and have legal arguments, while on Twitter they would just think and promote a narrative that is completely distorted and, and very biased. So. Certainly, Twitter is not the right tool to do peace, to make peace. It's the right tool to promote narratives. Sometimes, as Alan mentioned, it could be a narrative that fuel uh, peaceful protesters or peaceful social movements, but still, uh, so far, the people who have been very efficient at being heard on Twitter are the extremists. And it's because there is something in the DNA of Twitter that reward simplistic and extremist positions which are so uh, fueling the extremists in uh, all societies. I want to say a last word on, on Christian Freeland and on Twitter diplomacy by the President Trump and uh, mistakes. At the level of, the, of an institution, it's a, it's a 
very profound change for Minister of Foreign Affairs. Because Twitter, if you want to be efficient on Twitter, you need to be reactive. You can wait for, if you're in Brussels, you can wait for Ottawa to give you, to approve the tweets you're going to do. So you need to have diplomats that are at the front line, that first know what to say, and second, that are allowed to say what they, they need to say. Because without that, you won't have a Twitter account that is efficient and you won't use it efficiently to promote the narrative you want. And if you look around the world, some embassies and permanent representation are good at it and some are completely silent. They are not on Twitter because of that. Because first, they don't know, or second, they are not allowed by their headquarters. But in terms so of power, there is a power shift here where frontline diplomats all of a sudden became very um, important in a way, much more than before when they just have to implement what was decided by headquarters. Now they had to put into words, into tweets, the, the narratives that they, they are. And obviously some are good, some are bad, some make mistakes, some don't. And this is what happened out there constantly on Twitter, it's there and then you cannot uh, have it back. And in the case of the map for Russia, not Russia, it was successful, but it could also have been a mistake. And in fact, the intern who drew the map thought it was a mistake at the beginning. So you never know exactly how it will end up. Let's, um, let, let's speak about Christian Freeland for a minute. Christian Freeland, I think, is a, she was, when, before she was in politics, she was a journalist. And at the time she was a journalist, she was fascinated by Twitter diplomacy. And in fact, while I was working on Michael McFalls, I saw several interviews of her interviewing Michael McFalls and looking at how he did what he did. So certainly, if someone is skillful on Twitter diplomacy, she is skillful. So I think we cannot believe that it's a mistake. It's certainly not a mistake. Uh, this tweet was designed as such. There are two things that I want to um, outline here. First, the, the controversy was fueled by a mistranslation of the tweet, and this mistranslation of the tweet was probably intentionally promoted by Saudi Arabia. So I think the reception was failing in a way, or intentionally failing, but not the, the sender. The sender did uh, send a message that was intended to do what it did. And you have to, re that's the second point I want to make, you have to remember the context of this tweet. At the time, the Trudeau government was um, in the midst of controversy about selling arms to, to Saudi Arabia and having uh, the burden of justifying this uh, sale while it's economically important, but obviously it goes against value of Canadians because at the time Saudi Arabia is, was involved in a war uh, and might use these weapons in that war. So with one tweet, if you think about it, Canada and the Canadian government was able to see or to promote a narrative where it stands strong against Saudi Arabia and for women's rights, while the deal with uh, um, Saudi Arabia was never touched. So it's a very efficient tweet in terms of politics in terms of political impact, certainly it fueled controversy between the two countries, and this is bad, but in terms of internal politics, internal dynamic, domestic politics, well, I think if you ask Christian Freeland, she would say it's a perfect tweet. It makes the government look good in the eyes of public opinion at a time where it was deep into trouble because of its decision. So I wouldn't frame it as a mistake for sure. Sorry for the long answer. Thank you, Jeremy. That's fascinating to see. You know, it is a very powerful tool, these tweets. But you know, also, once you launch a narrative, sometimes you can't control the narrative, right? And you know, some, I think that's what some diplomats also realize. You know, they have a particular intention with the tweets, but you know, what, how it evolves and what implications that it has and what groups it reaches and how it's being used. You know, it cannot be controlled by one, and that's also the fascinating story. Um, Alan, when you, I think it was on your last slide, you know, you, you alluded to the fact that we need more public education about this. And 
know, the sense was that our awareness of the nuclear threat is not really much in the public eye at the moment. And so one of the questions here um, uh, that, that we, uh, we had um, is uh, considering from so considering the public political debate, do you see a lack of proper public awareness of the security risk associated with nuclear weapons? Uh, there does not seem to be much evidence of a new peace movement. Uh, so if you, if you think back, you know, throughout the Cold War, uh, the, the Easter marches, you know, the, the awareness of threat associated with nuclear weapons was very much a, an issue of concern, of public concern. We don't see much, or maybe you know, it's me not following these uh, these discussions. But the, what is your sense on you know, in terms of a more public, um, popular reaction to this very threat of nuclear? Yeah, I think it's weapons? an excellent question. Um, I think what's a number of things are, are going on that sort of explains what we're seeing. I think the first piece is there certainly is, in fact, quite a robust movement out there or, or sets of movements trying to address nuclear weapons. I think one of the challenges though is it's quite fragmented. There are groups that are pursuing somewhat different agendas that are somewhat in alignment. And frankly, I think there's, there's a lot of competition out there for the ear of the interested public. And what we're missing is a broad tent movement, a broad tent organizational capacity that can bring together all of these different agendas under one large mass movement. And that was really the origins of the big peace marches of the 1980s, for example, and the big poster campaigns and the, the button, the no nukes campaign button uh, campaigns. It was, it was people that were unified around a common set of advocacy goals with respect to nuclear weapons at a time when there was a real clear and present danger. And while these movements still exist, many of the original Cold War movements are still functioning. They're still in operation. And there's been uh, the development of many new ones along the way. But what is missing is that, that big unifying element. And that's why we're not seeing the mass movement I think uh, Jeremy's comments are quite pertinent here. I think through social media, the effect of these groups' presence has been to fragment attention, diffuse attention to a number of different groups and weaken then the capacity for a collaboration in a common space. So I think that's one explanation. I think there's a larger structural thing going on here though. Um, I think particularly for this generation, I, I think the big existential threat is climate change. And, and I, I think that there's only so much space in people's lives for advocacy around a potential apocalyptic scenario. And I think what's happened now is that climate change for all for very good reasons, certainly not disagreeing, has captured the public imagination. And that's where we are seeing the energy. That's where we're seeing the drive, the, the activity, the advocacy. And I think that's drawn attention away from the apocalyptic scenario of the Cold War, which was nuclear war and nuclear extinction. Uh, now the extinction is seen in terms of climate change. So I think these things are combining to weaken the capacity of anti-nuclear activists to create the kind of mass momentum that characterized the big, highly visible public expressions of political dissent that occurred during the Cold War. Thank you. Yeah, fascinating observation. And indeed, you could, you know, then link it back to Jeremy's uh, point about key narratives informing the public debate. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. You know, what gets the public attention and what is you know, not objectively, but in the minds of the people, what is seen as a major threat to the dystopian vision of, of the future that we need to rally uh, around. Um, so there are two sets of questions. I'm aware, you know, we're getting towards the latter part of our webinar. Maybe the, the next one is for, for you, Jeremy. There are two questions about the change in diplomacy. The first from Peter, um, if you consider the 
the day-to-day -day agenda of digital diplomacy? Has it empowered particular groups of actors in government or in the foreign office? Do we see a diffusion of competence and authority in, in the diplomatic um, endeavors? And I think that Rod um, added here uh, from Yavik, frontline diplomats become more crucial, question mark. Uh, they're closer to the story narrative on the ground. So is this good or bad? You know, I think, Jeremy, you, you, you touched on this a little bit already. Uh, do you see a shift in, you know, who the actors are and who defines, you know, the narratives by these kind of tweets? You know, you, you said it's very difficult to, to, uh, to vet these tweets, right? Yeah, so do we see it people on the uh, decentralization or, a, or the diffusion of authority in tweets? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Thanks a lot for the question. These are good questions. I'm not sure about the diffusion of authority by through Twitter. I mean, certainly um, the medium has changed the message, as I've told, I like simplified the message, so it creates narratives that are more conflictual. But in terms of who is empowered to promote narratives, the roles are pretty stable, if you think about it. So. You have uh, decision makers, elites, uh, promoting a narrative, uh, having their political message, and you have the audience, the journalists, most of, most of the people, or, 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 um, many people on Twitter are journalists, so they, are, they use Twitter as a, as a way to uh, find information, and they, they treat uh, Twitter, uh, the tweets, as a press conference, so as a source of information, and in the end, the people, the people who are even on Twitter, uh, the common people, let's say, they most of the time, unless they are retweeted by Donald Trump because he thought it's very relevant, among the 50 person he's uh, following, which is uh, unbalanced because he's followed by uh, 50, 50 millions. Well, most of the time, the audience that common people can get is not that uh, major. So. It's not a transformative tool in terms of power relationship within society. It creates possibility for dialogue and it creates create possibility for mobilization, like we saw in the Arab Spring, for instance. Certainly, especially at the beginning, now it's probably more monitored, so it's probably more difficult for, for social movements to be revolutionary using Twitter. More or less, I would say that today it's still a tool that empower the most powerful then allows the, the powerless to to question the, this power. About frontline diplomacy, I think it, it's, it starts to be more important in decision making process because uh, thanks to Twitter because well from Ottawa it's very difficult to understand what is the narratives that is efficient, what can be heard, what political message can be uh, listened to if you are like an ambassador in Egypt or an ambassador to Saudi Arabia or anywhere. So you have the political agenda that is decided in Ottawa or in headquarters for sure, but who is able to promote this narrative, who is able to engage the audience in ways that make this political message heard, it's the frontline diplomats. It's not the the people in headquarters because they know the political message but they don't know how to frame it. They don't have the, especially if you think about humanizing, humanizing the, the diplomat, speaking about what, for instance, Russians think about or live or, or experience. This is the kind of information you need to put in your tweet to have your tweets retweeted. So I think, yes, it makes, uh, uh, social media makes frontline diplomats more important then less important. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, we now have a couple of questions. Um, I think that essentially they boil down uh, uh, Douglas and, and Nancy's question uh, to suggest uh, our clear-cut uh, dividing line between nuclear weapons on the one side and more conventional weapons on the other. Maybe, you know, technology has blurred this line. and. You know, uh, provocatively, provocatively, Douglas Ross asks, you know, is there already, you know, a nuclear arms race on the way, promoted by new technologies that, you know, also, you, know, you, you might recall President Trump, you know, wanted to revive, you know, the, the small scale nuclear weapons, you know, and 
You know, so it's, it's reintroducing new elements in this arms race through the back door. Um, I think that will be for Alan uh, to comment on. You know, you can see here uh, that was list a whole range of um, of new technological developments, robotic UUVs, um, hypersonic missiles, and all those kind of things that we see. And now that was very much the spirit of your presentation as well, to be able to, to, to see how technology changed the context in which we think and address uh, nuclear arms races, right? And um, could, could I uh, invite you to comment on um, the, the, the new challenge that is involved with these uh, very fast ways of delivering these nuclear weapons, um, supersonic uh, rockets. We, we heard about Russia being the forefront and of developing these new technologies. Um, Alan, uh, your, your view on, on those Thanks challenges. for the question. And, um, you know, is there already a nuclear arms race underway? And I think, I think you could make a case for it. Um, I, I think during the Cold War, we got very used to seeing the nuclear arms race in the context of two things. First, the number of warheads and increases in the number of warheads. And then secondly, um, significant innovations in delivery capacity, whether it was from the bomber to the ICBM and then the cruise missile, and then improvements in accuracy. Uh, what's happening now, and I completely agree with the technologies that Doug Ross has identified as being worrying, is we're seeing two things happen. We're seeing on the one hand, a new set of technologies. I'll, I'll, I'll walk back a moment. Not necessarily new set of technologies, but the fusion of old technologies with new capacity that is, or the combination of technologies mm -hmm. that is serving to destabilize uh, the nuclear relationship between the US and Russia and India, Pakistan, to take two main dyads. Um, my great fear and it's one that I know is widely shared, is that these technologies are serving to undermine the stability, this awkward strategic stability between the United States and Russia by creating incentives for a first strike. All the technologies that Doug Ross lists there and some of the ones I raised as well carry the potential for either country beginning to believe that under certain circumstances, they might be able to conduct a preemptive attack. That is the absolute last thing you want anyone in Washington or Moscow to start believing. And so I, I think what we're witnessing is these technologies are now becoming the main focal point of the security dilemma and or the arms race that is uh, currently underway. We, we, we're used to thinking about in terms of uh, increases in the number of warheads. We're not really seeing that right now. In fact, the direction is opposite it's towards a decline in the number of warheads, but we're seeing the competition now shift much more into the area of delivery systems. And the fact that most of these delivery systems are explicitly designed to bypass, uh, threaten the other side and any defensive capability or early warning capability it might have is especially worrying. And then when you add to that the fact that the uh, bilateral nuclear weapons arms control arrangement between Russia and the United States is now essentially dysfunctional. And then add to that the dysfunctionality of the multilateral arms control agenda. What we have is a, is a toxic combination of developments where countries are now pursuing these technologies, but absent the larger conversation about strategic stability and how arms control can be used to complement or reinforce strategic stability in the context of national security strategy. For the disarmament advocates, th this, is, this is just a disaster because not only are we not making progress towards disarmament, we're actually starting to step backward. So I think the broader picture is very worrying. And if you add together new technologies in the area of artificial intelligence, robotics, miniaturization, and the last point about the, in 
about dual use technologies, technologies that can be used for both conventional strike over long distances and nuclear strike. Uh, things become even more worrying. We've always had this sort of dual use problem um, in uh, arms control. It is now being compounded with, by the proliferation of technologies that can be used with either conventional warheads and or with nuclear warheads. And then the question about low yield nuclear warheads and where's the threshold? Um, is it below a kiloton? Uh, if you're in the sub kiloton range, is, is that just as reasonable to use as a high uh, powered explosive, conventional explosive? So we're really treading into fundamentally new waters with a lot of these technologies. And because our diplomacy and our uh, treaty environment is so badly damaged right now, we lack the mechanisms to even have constructive conversation about it. So I find all this very worrying. And in fact, um, I see this as a, a, the next big issue to be addressed. Uh, I'll leave it there. There's a, a lot of other things that could be added to it. But I think both of those questions are, are absolutely spot on. Thank you, Alan. And yeah, you leave us with a lot of food for thought, but also definitely some worry about where we're going with controlling the arms race and, and addressing it, uh, the threats that are becoming so pertinent in, in terms of also involuntarily unleashing the deadly potential of these weapons. Um, I, I, I'm tempted to go to Doug uh, Ross' question about China and its impact, but, but I think you're yeah, looking at the time. Maybe we can wrap up. Jeremy, do you have any final reflection that you would like to share with us? No, except at this point. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if if uh, if there is a, another common theme between the two, our two presentation is uh, our pessimism in a way. So. <laughs> Maybe uh, next time we should uh, think about being more optimistic. Oh, it, it, it's for me to thank you. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, I think um, the participants share my sentiments. It's been a very stimulating discussion. And thank you for drawing attention to something that definitely needs more public awareness and expertise. And uh, I think we see some of those stories unfolding as you know, in our current political environment you know with the tweets with with digital uh, diplomacy and but also the the fundamental threat associated with nuclear weapons so thank you very much and uh, I would like to thank our participants for joining us today and, uh, and my best greetings over you know to Vancouver from Victoria uh, to my colleagues uh, in uh, on the mainland so there thank you very much Alan, thank you all. to my colleagues uh, in uh, on the mainland. So there, thank you very much, Alan you and Jeremy, all. and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.